Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we will be talking about three things you must know about forbearance program and also what um, the new guidelines changes that's going on with um, Freddie, Mac, Freddie Mays and VAs and FHA loan. Today we have our rep report from, um, he's a mortgage banker from Cost Country Mortgage and he's going to talk to us about all the details we need to know. Uh, Al, you would, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Hi, everyone. How are you? Uh, I'm Al Rapport, as I mentioned, Cross Country Mortgage. We're a direct mortgage banker. Uh, my office is here in Cranford. I've been in the uh, mortgage business for over 16 years, and prior to that, um, I had uh, worked in the appraising business. Uh, my father was an appraiser, and I come from a whole family of appraisers. So I have uh, I kind of wear both hats nowadays to uh, to do what I do for a living. Excellent. Uh, so uh, Al, talk to you know, with over 25 million people apply for, you know, unemployment and then over 9 million, about, about 9 million people, you know, household um, register for um, forbearance. What are the three things we really need to know about forbearance program? Sure. Yeah, it's a real timely uh, question because it's, it's on everyone's mind right now. Uh, first thing you need to know is that uh, forbearance isn't a forgiveness of payment. What it does is it allows somebody to put off making their payment until they're in a better financial situation. Um, so generally speaking, the type of loan that you currently have is going to determine what kind of plans are available for you, forbearance plans. Uh, so when I say type of loan, I'm talking about, do you have a conventional mortgage, Fannie Mae owned? Is it Freddie Mac owned? Is it an FHA loan? Is it a VA loan? The, the next thing that you need to identify is who is the loan servicer? In other words, who are you making your monthly payments to? All of those things are gonna take, uh, be taken into account when a lender works out a forbearance plan. There's a number of different types of forbearance plans that a lender can work out, okay? So a, a pretty common one is a lender may say, okay, you can't make your payment today, we'll give you three months off on the mortgage in month number four, you have to repay all four months. I've seen that one. Um, that's not really that favorable. If you think about it, if you don't have the money to make a monthly payment today, chances are you're not gonna have a, a ability to make a four month payment in month number four. There's another option where they could say, okay, if your payment is normally $4,000 a month, we'll allow you to make a payment of $2,000 a month. And then at some point over the next 12 months, we'll ask you to make up that difference of what you weren't able to pay during this time. Again, not the best option. A third option though that I've been seeing sometimes being offered um, is where they say, okay, you can't make three months today, fine. You have a 30 year mortgage, now your mortgage is gonna, we're gonna defer those missed payments that you're missing today to the back of the loan. So you can restart making your payment after month three um, and you'll continue to make your payments going forward and you'll just have a longer term. That's usually the, most preferred way, but not everyone's getting that option. And a lot of it has to do with what type of a loan you have and who's servicing it and what they're willing to offer people. And it, can you request that, um, that option with, uh, with your bank or, or that depends on the bank? You, you can request it. They're, they're not required to offer it to you. Um, frankly, what, here, here's the way it works. Right now, if you're late at the time when you request the forbearance, they will continue to report you as late during the forbearance. If you're on time at the time that you go into forbearance, they will continue to report you on time on your credit report. So technically it's not impacting negatively your credit, but I do want to impress upon people that there are notes being input in people's credit report that does show that the loan was put in forbearance. Um, so a lender, let's say you went into forbearance today and you, three months later, you decide, you know what, I want to refinance this loan or I want to go buy something else. A lender that you apply uh, for a mortgage with down the road, they're going to be able to see through the notations made in your credit report that you were in forbearance. Uh, so I do want to put that out there, that that's important. Uh, to answer your, your original qu uh, question, well, you can ask they're not required to give you that more preferable plan. They may offer you one of those few options that I mentioned earlier. 
So, and then you mentioned about, you know, being on your credit report. So, so they're saying that if you apply for forbearance right now, that it's not going to show up, it's not going to hurt you at all whatsoever? It's not going to impact your credit score. Okay. If, if at the time that you entered forbearance, you were already on time, and let's say you lost your job and now you can't make a payment, right? A lot of people have lost their job, over 30 million people uh, in the past month or so. So it's, it's common. It's, it's happening all over the place. And let's say you lost your job and you cannot afford to pay and you go into forbearance. It's not supposed to impact your credit. The way that it was written into the, into the wording of the law, uh, it does not impact your credit score. But there is a notation on your credit report, which when someone pulls your credit in the future, they will see that you were in forbearance. And some lenders are taking that into account. So does that hurt someone, let's say, if they want to, you know, let's say they sell this home and they, they purchase another home, that maybe a smaller home, whatever it is. So does the lender look at that and say, okay, you know what, I would need you to make sure you have more reserve or, um, you know, X, Y, Z to go through with this loan? It's fairly recent, right? This whole, this whole phenomenon is going on and it's basically, we're, we're dealing with it real time. Um, but I have heard, yes, that some lenders are going to take into account when they underwrite a future file, when they look back over the last 12 months, if they see that you have been in forbearance, they may scrutinize that file a little bit more. And then let's say, let's say you do, you know, go for the forbearance and after three months that you cannot pay back the three months loan, then what happened? Does your house go become short sale, foreclosure? It what's the next step? It does not. So okay. what, what you should do, let's say you took a three month plan and in month number four, you were supposed to repay the whole thing. And let's say for the fourth month rolls around, you just don't have it. You, what you should do is contact the same loan servicer and explain the situation. The issue that existed three months ago is the same issue that exists now. The servicer can rework a second plan behind it. They, they don't have to stick, you know, they can amend or modify the terms of the original forbearance. Um, so that is an option. Uh, they may amend the terms of the forbearance. You know, for example, maybe initially they required repayment after the fourth month. Maybe they may reduce the payment going forward, or perhaps they may tack it onto the back of the loan. So there is an option where they can amend it. Um, but no, they don't automatically go into foreclosure if they can't meet the terms of the original agreement. But most important, people should be reaching out to their loan servicer immediately. Once they know that they're getting to that fourth month and, and that was the original plan and they can't make that payment as the original agreement called for, they need to reach out to the loan servicer. So is it, is it an other option and is it going to forbearance? Is it better for them to let's say, you know what, I have some fund reserve, but you know, I don't have as much I want to you know, put into a mortgage payment. Is it better for them to go right to like modify their loan or go right to forbearance? Which is better? I, I would say it's case by case. Okay. Um, I, I would say it's, it's a tough question to answer. It, a lot of times the forbearance makes sense. If you've lost your job and you have reserve, but you want to hang on to it a little bit until you, let's say you were furloughed, for example. A lot of people, they haven't permanently lost their job. They've been furloughed while their business has been shut down. If that's the case, a forbearance is probably going to make you know, a good amount of sense for that person. Um, maybe they may want to look into a refinance too to lower their payment. There's different options available, and it really is something that's case by case and what's going on in that person's situation. Okay. Uh, what else do you think we need to know about forbearance? Um, I, think, I think we've more or less covered the, the, the general aspect of it. There's a lot of specifics involved. Uh, and, you know, of course, if anybody has any specific questions, I'm happy to answer those. But I think the general gist of it we've covered. So, uh, so let's move on. I know that now there's a lot of changes and guidelines that's changing around with all different types of loans. So you want to cover, um, I don't know, from Freddie Mac, Freddie Mace, and, and so on and so forth? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'd say probably one of the most uh, <laughs> convoluted, one of the most difficult things to understand right now is the world of appraising and how that's impacting mortgage lending. Right now, there's four different options for an appraisal. Um, if I have a client that applies for a mortgage with me, um, 
I can handle that one of four different ways. The first option is in certain cases, their deal may qualify for an appraisal waiver. That's on a purchase or a refinance. That could be on a primary residence, a second home, or an investment property. They may be able to qualify for an appraisal waiver. Um, now, that's most preferred, right? Because in a case like that, we don't, we don't need an appraisal. We accept the value as it is, and the client doesn't get charged a fee for the appraisal. So that's fantastic. Um, if it doesn't, let's go down the list. If the person's applying for a refinance loan and they have an appraisal that we as the lender ordered within the last 12 months, we can get something called a recert of value, which is we go back to the original appraiser and we ask them to give us a certification that the value has not decreased since the original report that occurred within the last 12 months. That's option two. That way the appraiser doesn't have to go into the property, doesn't have to do anything. They just research the comps, make sure that there's been no negative impact on the value, produce a report to us. It's a discounted fee, very easy. That's on a refinance. Option three, let's say they don't score an appraisal waiver and now we wanna see if there's a way to have a less of an inspection of the home, right? A lot of people are obviously dealing with the social distancing impact that the virus has brought upon us. So the, the option there is to do an exterior or a desktop report. Some deals are qualifying. It depends on the characteristics of the deal. Um, in, per, in the case of purchases, generally speaking, you can qualify most times uh, for an exterior only or desktop appraisal. If you're doing a refinance, it's gonna depend on if you're taking cash out or no cash out, and that will determine whether or not, uh, and also the occupancy of the home, and that will determine whether or not you can get a, um, an exterior only or a full inspection. And then obviously the fourth option is the regular old uh, full inspection where they have to go inside the home, look at every room. That's the least preferred way, but that's the fourth option available. And are you seeing home being appraised at the current value or, is, or having a difficult time appraising right now? Um, I, I would say most homes appraise where, where at the purchase price, most. Um, but look, an appraisal is a snapshot in time. When an appraiser is appraising a property, uh, you have to realize they're sourcing comparable sales from the last six months. That's how it's done. So if there's been an impact on that subject market in the last six months, let's say there haven't been a lot of sales going on, it may impact the appraisal going forward, right? Uh, so it depends on the market. It depends on how well priced that home was. I would say the vast majority of them are appraising right now, but you know some are certainly not. And then those in those cases, you have to go back and renegotiate that price. Okay, before we go to uh... FHA and VA loans. Uh, what about jumbo mortgages right now? Uh, how easy are they to get or how difficult are they to um, apply right now? Those are more of a challenge. Is there jumbo financing available? Yeah, absolutely. You can get a jumbo loan. Are the terms where they were two months ago? No. Generally speaking, lenders have, in some cases, they've stopped taking applications for jumbo loans. Other lenders are taking them, but they've they're charging a premium on the rate. So the rates on those are a little bit higher. You know, the days of having jumbo rates at a lower interest rate than a regular Fannie Mae loan, those are more or less gone, uh, at least in the short term. Uh, jumbo rates are higher right now. Uh, and the guidelines that want, with which somebody can qualify for a jumbo loan, those are more restrictive. So it is a little bit more difficult to get a jumbo loan and the rates are gonna be higher. The terms aren't gonna be as pretty. Um, Sometimes you can work around getting a jumbo loan. Uh, for example, in most of the northern New Jersey counties, uh, those are considered high cost counties. So the threshold before it becomes a jumbo loan is 765,600. Once you go a dollar over that, that's when it becomes a jumbo loan. Sometimes you can combo the loan up, meaning that you could do a first and second mortgage. So you would do the first mortgage at the 765 number, and then maybe take a small piggyback second mortgage behind it. Uh, and this way you don't have, um, a jumbo loan, if it's close, right? And if not, then you play around in the jumbo arena. And so it's like, is that like the 80-10-10 concept, kind of? Yeah, more way? or less, right. yeah, okay. more or less. It, it does, it, exactly. Um, okay. The first mortgage we would cap at the 765 to avoid going into the jumbo arena. And then we'd put a piggyback loan behind it. It depends on what your total loan amount is. And then it also depends on what percentage of financing you're, you're at. But 
that's another option to kind of avoid having to deal with the jumbo aspect of things. So as of today on May 13, what is the mortgage like interest rate right now for a jumbo loan versus a uh, not jumbo loan? For I, a I, perfect, it's just perfect scenario, I would say jumbo loans are probably going to be upper threes, low fours, something like that uh, for you know, an excellent scenario. Uh, and then if you're less than excellent, well, it's gonna, you know, it may have an impact on the rate. And what about for under their, their jumbo loan, uh, their conforming loan, so what's the price? Rates right now are really good. If you have a regular conventional Fannie Mae mortgage or Freddie Mac mortgage, and let's say it's, a, it's a, the cream puff of a scenario, a single family primary residence, you've got great credit, you've got good equity in the home, your debt to income ratio is solid, and you're still employed right? A perfect scenario. You're going to be looking at a 30 year fix somewhere in the very low threes right now. Um, rates are extremely favorable. That's why, you know, generally speaking, if you're in the mortgage business, refinances are strong. Um, as long as you're, you know, qualified enough to get a loan. And, and is this better for someone to do a 15 years versus a 30 years other than the, you know, other than the, you know, the payments obviously would be more for 15 years, right? Because you have to pay it faster. Yep. But do they get a better interest rate? Like, is it that much better interest rate for 15 years right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I like to advise people um, as follows. If you can afford the 15 year payment and you're not really interested in the cash flow of a loan, like, uh, put aside investment properties for the time being. I'm talking about a primary residence. If you're looking to get the cheapest payment, you want to go with a 30 year fix. If you're looking to pay the least amount of interest and the least amount of interest rate on a loan, go with a 15 year. If you can afford that payment, that's the right play for a primary residence. Um, the challenge is, you know, the payment's higher, right? Because you're paying it off over a shorter period of time. So not everyone can afford it or wants to pay it. Or some people, you know, especially in this economy, they don't want to take on a higher payment. So they may want to stick with a 30 year option, or maybe they'll take a middle ground and look at a 20 year fixed. That's also an option available. Uh, but generally I would say you're probably about a half a percent difference between a 15 year and a 30. So that's a pretty significant savings. And then when you run an amortization schedule to compare apples and apples, how much interest would you have paid over the life of the loan of a 15 year versus a 30? It's not even close. You pay so much less interest on a 15 year. It's roughly like 35, 40% of what you would have otherwise paid for on a 30 year at the same loan amount. So you save a lot. And then what about, okay. what about the 10 years on um, and the seven years on? Um, are those like favorable? Are those, is it better to just do a 15 year? Um, right now, uh, and Scott, I saw you had a question, so I'll, I'll get with you in a second on that. Uh, right now, I'm hardly writing any arms. Uh, the rates on the fixed are so favorable. Um, I'm not even looking in the direction of an arm. Generally speaking, in the past, if you did an arm, the whole point of it was to get a lower rate. And that's not really the case right now. In some cases, I price out the same scenario as a 30-year fix, and I price out an arm, and the arm's higher. It makes no sense, right? So it doesn't, for, from, from a client's perspective, you, you should be looking at a fixed and then just determining what term you want to be at so that your payment is comfortable. Does someone have a question? Yeah. So okay. um, going back to the forbearance, if you do the forbearance for like three, four, or five months, whatever you decide on, could they increase your rate at all during that time? Like when you buy, it, when you pay it back or can, can, once you're locked in that rate, you're locked in, they can't increase your rate. Yeah. The, that's not supposed to happen. The, the point of the forbearance is you've got a financial hardship. Um, the way that the wording is written in the law right now in the, in the cares act, they, you don't even have to really prove what your hardship is. You request the forbearance. That doesn't allow the lender to go and change the terms of your loan, uh, like your interest rate. And your, that's not what that's designed to do. What it's designed to do is give you a break. It's a temporary break. You're kicking the can down the road and revisiting later once, you know, theoretically your, your situation improves. Although, you know, who knows? Everyone's situation is different. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You know, speaking of that forbearance, uh, when do you have until to apply for forbearance for this COVID-19 situation? They just like, um, is that deadline? There is, I don't have it off top of my head. I believe I just read something recently that they 
pushed it out, but I, I'll get back to you on that one. I don't have that one off the top of my head. Yeah, that would be great for that's just so we find out so we can actually just let people sure. know. Okay, so um, uh, so let's move on to I know there's uh, big changes with the uh, you know FHA and VA loan. So let's talk about that. What's going on in that world right now? So. Well, let's, let's, those are both generally grouped under the topic of government loans, right? FHA loans and VA, those are government loans. So a lot of lenders right now, um, they have tightened up their guidelines a lot, especially when it comes to FHA loans. The, you know, they, they are being much more selective in the borrowers that they're taking on for FHA loans. I've heard of a lot of uh, lenders that are increasing uh, the minimum credit score. Some are not taking loans under a 620. Some are not taking loans under a 660. I've, I've heard a wide range of how people are reacting to those. Um, generally speaking, FHA does allow to go down to a 500 credit score as long as the buyer has a 10% down payment. Um, now your rate's going to be higher, right? Because if you're a 500 credit score, obviously you didn't get there by accident. Your credit's not the best. Uh, so it's going to impact your rate. But, you know, some lenders are still offering that. And while others have got, you know, the pendulum has swung to the other side and they're really tightening things up on their end. Um, VA, same, you know, uh, VA loans, I've, I've heard of less tightening there than I have on FHA, frankly. Uh, I've heard a whole wide range of overlays beyond, what, um, and just to clarify, so an overlay, uh, let's say there's a, set of guidelines, right, for that govern FHA loans. And they say, okay, these are the, this is what you have to meet in order to qualify for an FHA loan. A lender may impose an overlay above that, which basically further restricts what's allowed um, for an FHA loan, right? So let's say, for example, a perfect example would be in the arena of credit score. If FHA allows a score down to a 500, but a lender says, we're not gonna take loans for people with a score under 620, that's an overlay. That's that particular lender's thing that's not an FHA thing. That's not a universal thing. So that's what I mean when I say overlay. Um, you, you generally, you've seen rates have been really solid with FHA. We're seeing rates that are super, super low. Like I've not seen in the 16 years I've been doing this. Um, but it is, you know, more challenging to qualify for them. No doubt about it. So, so for today in May, you know, middle of May, what is the FHA loan right now? If you have a five or ten percent, looking at a rate around 3% on an FHA loan right now. They're super low. And um, you, you guys are still able to provide that service, the FHA loan in a regular, for someone who has a low credit score or you guys have a higher standard? No, no, no. We, uh, my company, we're still going down, you know, as long as you've got a 10% down payment, we can do that loan down to a 500 credit score currently. You know, I, I don't know how long that's gonna continue for, can't speak to that, but as of today, we're still doing those. Okay, and that has to be your 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 primary residence, correct? FHA is always for primary, always primary. residence. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then VA could be any property, right, or multiple properties? No, VA is also always also for primary residence. Primary. Yep. Okay. Okay. It could be a multifamily home. You could buy a two-family home, live in one, rent the other. That's allowed, but you have to occupy. Got it. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, Let's talk about uh, refinancing option right now. Uh, how, how is that going? And it's, I mean, I know a lot of people are doing refi at this point. So, so refis, I, I think people think of them a little narrowly, right? You think, okay, I'm going to lower my rate and that's the purpose, but you can accomplish a lot through a refinance. There's a lot of different ways that you can um, refinance someone. I can take somebody from a 30 year to a 15 or a 20 year term, right? Shorten their term. Uh, lower their rate at the same time, but their payment may go up because I've shortened the, the period of time with which they're re, uh, repaying. Uh, they can do cash out. They could combine two mortgages into one. If you have two mortgages, first and a second, you start out, let's say, as a combo loan. Now you want to consolidate, make it into one. You can refinance to get rid of mortgage insurance. You can refinance to buy somebody out on the property. There's all different things that you can accomplish with the refinance. So what I usually do is get the you know, particulars of everyone's deal, figure out what are you trying to accomplish? What's your long-term goal with this property? Is this an investment? Are you looking for maximum cash flow? Are you looking to flip the property? How long do you plan on living there? Those are the important questions that you need to ask and understand before you can give advice on which way you want to go with the loan. Um, but I mean, from a rate perspective, it's going to be really hard to 
find a loan right now that doesn't qualify for a refinance, if that buyer, or I'm sorry, if that borrower is still uh, employed and their debt ratio works, and they have solid credit and good equity in the home, uh, chances are they're gonna probably benefit from a refi. Excellent. Uh, anyone have any question? About anything with mortgages, forbearance, uh, you can also type into the chat box as well. Uh, if you have any questions. So Al, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, so if someone want to get in touch with more about you know, all different programs from forbearance to Freddie Mac, Freddie Mays, to FHA, to VA loans or VFI, how do they get in touch with you? Call, email, text, I get any which way. Uh, my direct line is 201-604-3485. If they want to email me, it's al.rapoport, R-A-P-O-P-O-R-T, at myccmortgage.com. Excellent. If you can actually type that into the uh, chat box so people can have it uh, with them and, sure. uh, and we can go from there. Perfect. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for everyone time. And uh, if you guys Thank have you. another topic you want to cover, let us know. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing everyone next time around. Thank you. Everyone have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>